congratulations on your film. Um, Thank you so much. This is not the first time you've been to South by Southwest, right? This is your second time and a similar project. Can you tell us about it? Yes, the first time I was at South by, it was with uh, a short called Little Potato, which is an autobiographical short documentary, um, which was directed by Nathan Miller. And um, we won the jury prize that year, which was really awesome. Um, and there was a physical, actual physical festival. So, um, you know, this is going to be a very different experience, obviously, but uh, even more exciting since it's, a, it's the feature version of my story. Um, for those people who, 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 in the audience who don't know your story, can you briefly tell us what, what it is? I mean, this is the second film based on, it's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous story, so can you tell us? Thank you. Yeah, so this is a story of am I growing up in the Soviet Union, right, as it was kind of collapsing, disintegrating. Uh, my amazing mom, who was a doctor in prison and had a really rough life there, and she made the choice to become a mail order bride. And basically, uh, the film is sort of about our very adventurous escape from Vladivostok, Russia to Seattle in the States and all the different um, kind of twists that happen on the, on the way. Um, you know, it's, it's you're, 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 um, the way you show Russia is quite, quite bleak. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually you, you, can you talk about the style of your movie, the way you, 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 you pre present Russia and, Seattle and how you juxtapose them. Yeah. Um, so the Russia, you know, I mean, first of all, it's like the Russia of my childhood that doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, I'm not sure how much it's improved, but I know it it looks very different for sure. Um, so it's Vladivostok, which is far eastern Russia, which was kind of considered to be um, a very rough, one of the roughest places in Russia. And um, the way I decided to portray it is through this very stylized kind of painterly aesthetic. I'm very inspired by Baroque paintings where things sort of emerge from the darkness or dissolve into darkness. Um, so there's a lot of this kind of still tableaus where you're watching all of the action in the one in one sort of very meticulously composed tableau as opposed to a lot of cuts and and things like that. And it's meant to be representational, like I'm not hiding the fact that it's a movie. Um, you're supposed to be experiencing it as sort of like, this is a story of what happened, not actually, you know, this is not reality. Um, and it's also sort of a movie within a movie. So when we go back, when we go to the States, uh, the things, things open up, uh, we started shooting on locations. Um, it's a much more naturalistic style um, that's not meant to be fantastical or whimsical. It doesn't have magical realism in it the way that Russian scenes do. Um, <clears throat> when when you were growing up, I mean, you 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 developed a a, a a a love of film at a very early age, and it's a it's a, it's a great story. I and mean, if you can tell it that what how how you you stumbled upon uh, Hollywood movies, can you can you talk about that? Yeah, we fell in love uh, with American films first through this renegade, secret renegade pirate channel. So we used to have just one or two channels that were government channels. And all of a sudden, people were talking about this mysterious channel number three that would come up like really late at night, sometimes at midnight. And all they would do is show American movies. We didn't know even where it was coming from or who was showing these movies, but um they were all dubbed by this one person that always sounded like this because they were probably covering up <laughs> trying to hide their voice disguise their voice and the very first movie we saw that way was ghost so it was kind of a magical coincidence too you know the fact that it was our first american film on this kind of surprise secret channel that nobody knew about and it was a movie that's already very magical and kind of you know, unusual ghost. So um, we fell in love with American film right away. And 
you know, at one point people started to get like pirated VHS tapes and we just couldn't get enough of it. You know, you, um, uh, Greg Araki's film Living End plays a significant part in your, in your Seattle story. Um, yeah. Can you, uh, can you tell us how you discovered that film and, and how, how, how it plays out in your story? Yeah, so the, I mean, the film is like 99%, you know, really what happened in my life and including the Greg Araki thing where I, I started to go to this video store where my stepfather had a membership <clears throat> and I discovered again, lesbian section, which was so shocking to me as somebody coming from a place that had no acceptance of gay people at all. Um, so I was already just kind of scared and captivated by this gay LGBT movie section in the first place. And one cover really stood out to me. It was Greg Araki's Living End because uh, it's kind of sexy and edgy. And I just wanted to see that movie so much, you know, so much. And I couldn't get myself to, to do it. I was so scared that like my stepfather would find out that I rented it. Or I was even scared to just people see me approach that section. Um, so it's something I portrayed in the film, this sort of um, slow growth of like you come back and come back to this place and you think maybe I'll rent it and you change your mind, maybe I'll rent it. And finally, the character is finally willing to take that risk, <laughs> which seems silly now, I think, for younger kids growing up, hopefully in the States, hopefully it's not an issue for most people. But um, you know, back then it was such a big deal to me that I, you know, I took that step of renting that film. And of course you kind of want to hide and you don't want anybody to recognize it, but you get that really chatty video store clerk who wants to talk about it and you're like, no, 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 just let me go home. <laughs> you know, what's, what's amazing in your story is that you, know, you, you here you are coming from a very homophobic environment and you come to Seattle and you end up with this very homophobic guy's house who, who turns out, can you, can you explain about your stepdad? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's a twist that we, we I, I try not to give away, but basically, you know, my stepfather has a lot of skeletons in his closet, <laughs> but he's a very, very kooky, very repressed, kind of right wing Christian fundamentalist. And it's not something because of the language barrier, we didn't realize that that's how he was when my mom married him. And then we quickly realized that something's off. And there's a lot of sort of, um, I think it's it's sad and comedic at the same time, sort of the language misinterpretation and mis miscommunication between like my very progressive mom who doesn't speak as much English and this really conservative guy and this sort of clash of ideas that's happening. Uh, is, are they still together, your mom and him? No, they eventually divorced, and unfortunately, um, my stepfather passed away. Yeah, but we we did stay in touch. Now, um, how did you um, how did you get uh, in Seattle? How did you get into making movies? I mean that I um, I always wanted to make films. Um, when I got I got into University of Washington for college, and unfortunately, they didn't have like a practical film program at the time. So I also, you know, I have painting background. So I, I ended up uh, majoring in drama and interdisciplinary arts, which I'm really grateful for because I feel like in the arts and in theater, there's so much more freedom um, with experimentation and different forms that you, in film for some reason, there's, there's not as much mixing of narrative and experimental as I would like to see. And being from theater and arts background, like I just don't see those limitations as much. You know, I feel like why not do it this way? Um, and let's talk about the casting of your film. You've got, you've got uh, some really, really excellent finds. Uh, the, 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 the first, the, the Russian, Vasily, can you talk about that kid? He's, he's quite amazing. Yeah, so Hirsch Powers, I am so, so grateful that we found him. And the fact that the movie got made when it got made actually had a lot to do with him 
with finding him. So I started auditioning kids because I've never worked with kids before. And I thought it was going to be so hard to find a kid. And I was like, let's try and just cast the, you know, let's start casting now because it may take us years to find the right kid. And we started auditioning and we found Hirsch and he was just incredible. And that was kind of a kick in the pants for me to be like, okay, I have to raise money right now. I have to make it before he, <laughs> he grows up because he is so good. He is so good on camera. He's so compelling, has so much heart and just a really wonderful intuitive performer, um, that kid. So I have, I think he has a very bright future and I hope this film helps kind of propel that. Can you um, talk about some of your other casting choices? Yeah, so I initially wrote the screenplay for Mariah C. Kaminsky to play my mom, and she was kind of my muse for the whole project because I really sensed that kind of guarded, wounded energy that my mom has in her. So the the the, the entire project was initially sort of a, a platform for me to work with Mariah, and she fortunately she ended up playing my mother in the United States. Um, Tyler Bocock plays potato in America sort of in teenage years and he was another amazing find he's just so um, such a young actor who's just so intuitive I'm always amazed by young actors being you know having that emotional depth because I'm like where do you get that emotional intelligence you're so young you haven't had that many life experiences but some of these kids really do um, and same with Sarah Barbieri who plays uh, Lena, my mother in Russia. Uh, again, really young performer who's really intuitive, has this beautiful kind of energy, um, very mesmerizing to watch, in my opinion. Um, and then we have some bigger named actors that are, um, we were really lucky to get on board. Dan Loria from The Wonder Years plays my stepfather which is really fun because, you know, he's known to be this like iconic American dad in the Wonder Years. And now he plays sort of a very skewed American dad archetype in this film. Leah Delaria um, is so amazing as my grandma, Tamara. She's just really funny. Um, and she's another performer that I was really hoping I would get when I was writing a script and you know that rarely happens when you get exactly the person that you hope for and we were lucky to get her um, and then Jonathan Bennett has um, from Mean Girls has a has a fun um, cameo that I, I don't want to talk too much about but people really love his character uh, Lauren Chew Twees from um, The Love Boat and a lot of sort of 70s icon she has a small role so I was really honored to play, to work with her. She has a she plays a snoopy neighbor in the film. <laughs> uh, tell me, how do you navigate uh, at virtual film festival? I mean, you, you, same festival. You were there a couple of years ago, and then now you're there again uh, with a much bigger project. How is it? Compare the two. What is it like? Is it is it surreal? <laughs> it's very surreal. Yeah, it's it's surreal in a different way. I mean, I think. Uh, all of the filmmakers, I could speak for everybody, like we're so honored to be in the festival. It's such a huge, prestigious festival. Uh, but of course, everybody would love to see their work live, you know. Um, so we, you know, I appreciate how much South By has worked to make this festival possible this year, despite all of the challenges. Um, but, you know, it is weird to not have an audience, to not have to not have that kind of um, you know, being in the theater and you just feel the energy, usually you kind of feel the energy of the audience. Are they laughing? Are they crying? Whatever. And especially in this kind of film, that's kind of an emotional roller coaster. Um, so it's a very different experience. I'm getting lots of like personal messages from people who saw the film, you know, and them responding to it. But there's not a communal that communal experience. But, you know, the bright side is that it's so much more accessible this way to a wider audience. So I know a lot of people who are like, I could never afford it before, but now I've gone to, you know, Sundance and I've gone to South by because they're virtual and they're cheaper to attend. So I think that's the silver lining is how much more accessible these festivals are.
this year. As, as a filmmaker, I mean, the, uh, networking and, and pitching projects is, is a really integral part of going to a film festival. How, how are you managing to do is that how does that work in this in this situation that, that part they uh, that part is pretty easy um, the festival did a really good job for filmmakers there's this platform it's part of the online festival where we have our own profile with all of our information contact information and then everybody whose industry you know whether they're press or uh, Netflix or whatever, um, they also have the same profile. So if people reach out to you, you reach out to them. I mean, in some ways it's even easier to set up those meetings now virtually as opposed to, you know, because I wouldn't have necessarily known where those people are in the physical festival. In the virtual festival, I can just search and find people and they can find me uh, very easily. So I think that part really kind of works in this virtual world.